So let's just get started. We have some good information to learn from Dr. Charles Hall today. Um, he is with Albert Einstein School of Medicine, and um, we're going to just let him get started, and I can switch those screens whenever you're ready, Dr. Hall. Thank you. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to give this opening talk, and it's been an honor and privilege to be able to be one of the principles of this research. Uh, too, way too many people uh, make this happen besides me to put on a title side, but at the end, I'll have a long list of uh, people uh, to thank, and I hope that I didn't miss anyone then, but I'll get to that uh, when we're done. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> uh, the important disclosures, these are the many awards uh, that have supported this research. Uh, mostly from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, uh, and also from other agencies as well. Next. So we all are familiar with what happened on September 11, 2001, the terrorist attacks of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the crash of the plane in Somerset County. Uh, both of the towers at the World Trade Center collapsed completely in less than two hours. Uh, Blackout conditions, rescue recovery workers affected. The air quality monitoring station, which was in that part of Manhattan, was destroyed. Uh, there were almost 2,000, almost 3,000 deaths that day. Uh, it was the worst man made catastrophe in the United States since the American Civil War. And it was comparable to most of the worst of the natural disasters uh, in terms of death poll. But this is about what happened uh, afterwards. Next. So there you see one of the many photographs that you can find about the, uh, the actual hit next. Rescue recovery workers went there immediately in order to uh, find people and do the recovery of individuals next. Uh, one of the many photographs you find on the internet of the dust cloud, how huge it was and how uh, deep it was next. Uh, I see that there is a note in the chat not seeing the slides. Uh, are people able to see these? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, this uh, slide shows uh, a 3D map of the area. The four buildings that are in gray were, uh, were destroyed on September 11th. Uh, the two towers, just left the two towers is the... Is the uh, uh, World Trade Center 7, which collapsed late that day. The uh, relatively low life building in front in gray was the Marriott Hotel that's 22 stories. It was also destroyed that day. The red and the blue towers story uh, buildings, uh, I believe, have all been taken down. Uh, but you can see uh, the damaged buildings and the buildings that needed a lot of cleanup effort. This entire area was roughly a square mile. Next. Tens of thousands of rescue recovery workers were exposed to the dust cloud, hundreds of thousands of residents and workers. The fires continued into December. The recovery work continued for almost a year. There was not a lot of protective equipment at the beginning, it became more common as time went on. Debris sorting and transport was sent, they were transported to the reopened Fresh Kills landfill. And there are uh, people who are in this cohort who are a part of that effort who weren't even at the site. And there was awful lot of effort rebuilding the infrastructure, rebuilding some of the buildings that were damaged, uh, putting the wires back in for the power and the communications and so forth. Next. Uh, what we know is that dust samples were taken shortly after the attacks. There's a, a paper about that, that uh, did a great job of describing them. Numerous known and suspected carcinogens, irritants, biohazards. What we don't know is what was the components of the gases on the first day. And we don't have specific information on what components each individual was exposed to uh, because we really didn't have that kind of technology available then. Today we do, uh, but, uh, but back then that would have been very difficult. And we don't know how to, we didn't know 
how to combine the different exposure assessments. And we went to a lot of work on harmonizing that, which we'll talk about briefly later on next. So this is the paper I mentioned that characterized what was in the dust and the smoke uh, samples were taken within the first week. And this was published uh, relatively quickly. Next. And there you see some of the, uh, I say possible, some of these are actually classified as probable human carcinogens. I won't uh, take your time by reading them, but you can look at them on the site or even better by reading the excellent publication. What was not found, and this is, will be important later on, was radiation that was beyond background levels. Next. And uh, we did an internal review a few years ago to find out which components might be associated with different cancer sites. And uh, you see that um, uh, many, many sites were here. And NIOSH even sponsored an expert panel to discuss this. And we were advised not to a priori rule out any site. And this certainly established potentially uh, a biological plausibility uh, for cancer here. Next site. So why study cancer and disaster recovery, rescue recovery workers? Well, one of the obvious is the ethical imperative to support our responders and to give them assistance for uh, the adverse effects of some of their exposure. But there are also important scientific questions that can be addressed. This is a relatively short-term exposure followed by a potentially long-term follow-up. And thankfully, thanks to NIOSH, we have that follow-up. The induction and latency periods for most human cancers uh, I can actually honestly say is unknown. We do not have good epidemiologic evidence from human population studies for most cancers. We uh, can learn about the impact of screening programs, medical monitoring programs, and even potentially discover new insights into cancer biology. Next. And NIOSH has been funding a number of appli grant applications on this. There are three cohorts that follow rescue recovery workers. And you see them there, I won't go through reading them, but it's a wide variety of rescue recovery workers uh, and multiple clinics, multiple clinical centers of excellence for the two that are from medical monitoring programs. And the, importantly, the World Trade Center Health Registry, which is not a medical monitoring and treatment program, and also includes a large cohort of community residents and workers not engaged in the rescue recovery effort. And I'll mention that there is also a medical monitoring and treatment program for the community survivors, and also a national program for persons who are outside the New York area. I will not be presenting any data from those on this, uh, in this uh, talk though, next. Uh, so there they are. Uh, the residents and workers, other than the rescue recovery workers, probably had less intense exposure. Uh, uh, and they are would be very important to study. And I hope that we can get a study uh, of them similar to this as well. Next. So each of these three cohorts had published a total of uh, five uh, papers uh, looking at cancer incidents. Uh, and as you can see, there were somewhat consistent results in some of these, um, but there were a lot of non-significant increases because of the small number of cases and limited number of follow-up. Uh, and therefore we looked at, next slide, we looked at the possibility of combining the cohorts. And that after a lot of work uh, that resulted in this study being funded by NIOSH, thank you very much. Uh, and the primary research questions were to look at incidence, to look at latency, and to look at survival. Next. Um, these, this is specific aim one, which is really two aims. One is to create a cohort from all three of the pre-existing cohorts uh, with harmonized exposure definitions. And then to take that cohort and to estimate incidence of the cancers that we are a, were able to look at. And we actually have published a paper on that and uh, we'll, I'll be presenting results from that shortly. Next. Specific aim two was to take advantage of the long-term follow-up after a relatively short-term exposure and to examine the, the uh, 
induction and latency period for numerous cancer sites. Next. And specific game three was to look at survival after cancer diagnosis in uh, persons who were uh, exposed to the rescue recovery effort and uh, developed cancer. And um, we have findings on this as well as the other two specific games. And these I think are actually the most fascinating and important findings. Next. We have an ancillary study specifically for thyroid cancer that uh, uh, Rachel Zygongs, my colleague is the pr uh, principal investigator for. Uh, thank you for Nash for finding that. And I'll be mentioning one of that study's findings as well. And next, uh, another important study that I will not be presenting any findings for is a study that, um, uh, that is looking, that is uh, using a comparable, um, occupational cohort uh, from the pre-existing NIOSH firefighter study uh, to uh, look at another uh, comparison population. And it's worth it, it might be worth it to have a talk just on that because it's a fascinating study. Next. So we have uh, a publication on the uh, organization and methods for the study next. Uh, it was a huge effort to do all this work. This is not the data flow diagram. This is actually the administrative diagram of the different types of approvals that needed to be made. Um, we had a pre-existing IRB authorization agreement. We needed 14 data use agreements, a memorandum of understanding, 16 applications to various cancer registries, national death index, New York State, New York City vial records, 17 institution review boards had to approve this study. This was pre-single IRB, but I will briefly say single IRB, had it been in effect then, would not have speeded this up. And I can give some details on why that would have been an issue uh, that would not have done so later on. Next. Um, it took longer than expected to be able to get all the data. Here we have the, can the uh, cancer registries. When we submitted our first application to them, uh, it was first September 1st, 2016. And we finally received the last of the data on September 24th, 2019 over three years. I'll mention the notice of award was actually issued on September 2nd, 2016. We uh, went ahead and tried to, and got IRB approval from the main IRB that took, it was actually issued on September the 2nd, 2016. Uh, and we applied the, the day before for the initial cancer registry IRB. Uh, but the amount of work that was required to get all these approvals was longer than I had anticipated. And I thank Travis Kabai for giving a lot of support uh, and understanding for how difficult this process can sometimes be. And then after we got all of the data, there was an extensive data cleaning process and the dupl deduplication process. Next. So after deduplicating our uh, participants uh, to make sure that the persons who are in multiple cohorts are only counting once, we have this Venn diagram, total over 69,000 individuals. Next. Uh, demographics of the entire cohort. Uh, the majority of the cohort uh, as of September 11th was uh, midlife, 16% uh, Hispanic, 9% Black. These are exclusive, mutually exclusive categories, unlike the Census Bureau. Overwhelmingly male. Majority never smokers. That's important, and you'll see uh, you'll see in a few minutes how that may have affected some of our findings. Importantly, 71% were enrolled into one of the three cohorts by the end of 2004. So we think that there's not a lot of selective uh, enrollment uh, because of medical conditions. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Next. We had previously had a major expert, um, effort to harmonize the exposures in another talk I have given that's only the methods, I actually go through uh, grids with the various exposure questions and how tricky it was to harmonize these exposures. And we came up with a grading for dust exposure, 
specific questions for working on the pile. Early arrival has been associated in many studies with adverse health outcomes. And uh, we use that as an exposure as well. And um, we also use simply exposed versus not next. So this is our main cancer paper on incidence. I'll thank uh, Jay Wei Lee from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the World Trade Center Health Registry for taking the lead on this and doing a fabulous job. Next. Uh, the main results were standardized incidence ratios, which I'll speak about for a moment. It is simply a ratio of the observed cases divided by the, object, the expected cases. And the expected cases are based on strata that are defined in this study by age, race, ethnicity, and sex. And the expected number of cases is simply calculated by taking the number of person years for each stratum in the cohort by the rate in the corresponding general population stratum. And uh, the general population comparison group that was done in this paper uh, was New York State. And uh, we, we used exact Poisson models to estimate confidence intervals. Uh, we did not do, have to do that for many cancers, but for small cancers, that was for cancers with small numbers, I should say, uh, that allows all of our estimates to be comparable throughout our analyses. Next. Standardized instance ratios are robust to small strata sizes. So if you have a strata with only a small number of people, that is not going to be an outlier in this type of analysis. Uh, standardized instance, instance ratio analyses are very similar to a relative risk model that include all interactions for all combinations of stratification variables, as long as your stratification variables are categorical. So it can't handle uh, strictly speaking, continuous variables, but you can sort of fake it by having a large number of small strata next. Um, there are some limitations. Um, they are imprecise. The number of cases are small, which is true for pretty much all methods. Um, it ignores any variability in the estimation of case numbers, the reference population. So this gets into whether you're a frequent, hardcore frequent statistician or not. Uh, I did a calculation that the uh, variability of the case estimates, the reference population, if you aren't a hardcore frequentist, was two orders of magnitude smaller and could safely be ignored. More importantly, you cannot, um, except under pretty strict conditions, compare directly two standardized instance ratios with each other to get a relative risk. This is something you find in advanced epi textbooks. There's a great paper by Ben Armstrong, uh, I think Annals of Epidemiology 1995, that shows uh, that sometimes you can do this. I think I may have found um, a slightly less strict uh, uh, criteria, uh, but generally this is something that should be avoided. And this finally, the selection of proper comparison population is very important. And we'll talk about that later next. So here uh, are some of the findings. Uh, we confirmed the prior reports, and you see that in red, uh, of higher incidence for skin melanoma, prostate cancer, and thyroid cancer. Now, the interesting thing in thyroid cancer is that I mentioned there, the main risk factor for thyroid cancer that has been identified is radiation exposure, and we did not find significant level, the elevated level, levels of radiation at the site beyond background levels. And that is the reason for Rachel Zygon's ancillary study to look at this more carefully. And I'll say a little bit about that, but hopefully she'll get a chance to, uh, to explain in more detail her findings. We found uh, what apparently is an elevated rate of tonsil cancer, which we had not expected and was not seeing the other cohorts. Uh, we found significantly lower rates of lung cancer in the rescue recovery workers compared to the general population. And we think that this is probably because of lower rates of smoking. Uh, and that would be worth some more analyses. Overall, um, very, very modest reduction in overall cancer rates. And you'll see in a moment, next slide, some of the reasons 
uh, why we have lower rates. Uh, for reasons that we have not explained, and this is worth further study, we have significantly lower rates of a number of gastrointestinal cancers. Uh, these are lower than I can uh, easily write off to uh, confounding or lack of case ascertainment. Um, we, um, uh, and it is worthy of further study. Uh, this may simply be a latency effect because most um, gastrointestinal cancers are believed to have long latency periods. Uh, there, I think that that is, I think that for, col for colorectal cancer, uh, given the natural history of uh, precancerous tumors that we see in colonoscopies, that's a very believable uh, uh, con conjecture. Uh, and I don't know enough about the others to be able to really uh, comment on whether that's accurate or not. And someone else who's more of a cancer clinician might be able to say more. Next. We did not confirm the uh, previous reports of Elevin's instance of some of the hemologic cancers. And we're working on a paper to look at this more uh, carefully right now. And we found uh, reduced instruments of uh, two of female breast cancer and uterine cancer. Uh, and we did not find uh, uh, significant differences for uh, brain cancer. Uh, next. Uh, we did internal analyses in this uh, paper where we looked at arrival time and we found that for prostate, thyroid, and overall all cancers combined, we found a uh, fairly um, strong and highly significant effect uh, of arrival time. The persons who were, were arrived on September 11th have higher rates of cancer. Uh, it was not statistically significant from skin melanoma, but it was almost there. Uh, and for tonsil cancer, it wasn't, ex it was very small numbers uh, and not statistically significant. Uh, working directly on the pile uh, did not show much of uh, an effect, uh, but for prostate cancer and for all cancers overall, we did see uh, elevated instance for self-reported direct 9-11 dust exposure. Next. We wanted to take closer look at uh, some of the more common cancers, in particular to look at uh, latency induction period. And this is paper we published on the temporal association of prostate cancer instance with World Trade Center rescue recovery work. Next. On the left, uh, the green is the uh, instant straight over time, uh, a smooth curve uh, in, the, in the green with confidence interval. The red is New York State reference population, much narrower confidence interval. As I said, if you're a hardcore frequentist, you will say there shouldn't be a confidence interval. Uh, on the right is internal comparison. Red is arrived on September 11th. Blue is arrived the next day and green is arrived later. There seems to be a trend, although the confidence intervals overlap and we did get some significant trends. Next. Uh, we used change point models, which have been long been used in cancer epidemiology research. Um, we used a piecewise exponential model uh, that is very similar to a Cox regression model for survival analysis, except that the baseline hazard changes not with every event, but at fixed time intervals. So we chopped up period of follow-up into a large number of intervals and um, then considered the possibility that the um, uh, baseline hazard can change every time. And then we looked at the possibility that the relative hazard could change. Some big advantages here, you can estimate an actual baseline rate from here. Uh, the relative hazards and the baseline hazards have true rate and relative rate interpretations. You can directly compare the hazard ratios, unlike standardized instance ratios. And we put a change, possible change point in for relative hazard, and you can include confounders in the model. And we estimate change points in the data directly using something called profile likelihood, with which you biostat people probably heard in grad school. And in the question and answer period, I can give a more detail next. This is basically the model that we considered, a period 
uh, up to a certain point at which there's not a significantly elevated risk, and then a period at which there is a significant elevated risk, the dash lines or the confidence intervals, and one is the reference rate ratio. And then possibly at some time later on, the risk, the risk diminishes because the period of greatest risk would have passed. Next. For prostate cancer, we did not find a period by which, uh, at which the risk returns to no longer significantly elevated. That may be a manifestation of the relatively short 14 year follow-up period that we had for cancer incidence in this entire study. Uh, uh, but as you can see, uh, through the first four years of the, uh, or five years of follow-up, uh, we did not see significantly elevated uh, risk of prostate cancer. And then we had a modest rate uh, risk uh, afterwards. Uh, note that the hazard ratio is not the same as a standardized incidence ratio because we are controlling for the demographic confounders differently in this analysis. So that is not something that is to be alarming at all. And we found a similar situation for the internal analysis where we looked at arrival time. Next. We also similarly looked at skin melanoma to find out if we could find uh, uh, similarly a point at which uh, the latency period uh, can be estimated. Next. And here the top line is the risk of melanoma, uh, or actually the, it's actually the instincts rate. As I said, these have uh, instincts rate, but this is the unadjusted. Uh, and the red line is the New York state rate. Note that the New York state instincts of melanoma has been increasing over time, whereas for prostate cancer, it was decreasing. Um, whether the, uh, the, uh, the reasons for that are probably worthy of study by someone else. Uh, but you notice that it started out uh, elevated even shortly after 9-11. Now I had been thinking for most of my time working on this, that this, the melanoma incidence might have more to do with sun exposure than specifically World Trade Center exposure. First, let me show you the findings next. So we found low and non-significant difference from the reference population uh, in the first three years after September, after the, uh, after the World Trade Center attacks, and then a significant increase afterwards. And as you might can see from the graph, no evidence that the uh, rates are, uh, that the relative hazard are, is uh, declining. Uh, but I want to show you the next graph next, uh, the next uh, slide. Uh, to address the concern that maybe it was sun exposure rather than World Trade Center exposure, we looked at the location of the melanomas in the World Trade Center population compared to the New York State reference population. And as you can see, the most common site was the skin of the trunk, which would have been covered during the rescue recovery work. Even uh, the workers working outside, remember, September 11th was in September, and uh, there were hot days, but these, for most of the rescue recovery period, these were not days when one would want to take off one's shirt in the hot sun. Uh, the rescue recovery work continued through the winter. And for a number of others, uh, the, for a number of these other sites, there's not a lot of difference. So this to me is evidence that it's not just sun exposure, when 45% of the tumors are on the rescue recovery workers' trunk, more than the fraction you find in New York State. And the good news is uh, the large majority of these are localized tumors. And as we all know, localized melanoma can be cured. And metastatic melanoma, until recently, did not have a great prognosis. And you'll see, uh, we'll, I'll be talking about that shortly. Next. Uh, I mentioned uh, Rachel's uh, thyroid cancer study. Uh, one of the things we did for that was to do a change point analysis. Next. Uh, the rate of thyroid cancer was increased throughout the follow-up period. And Rachel and her uh, colleagues 
have published on uh, what they think are the reasons why, and I'm not going to give a spoiler, have Rachel come and give a talk on this work. It's really interesting. Uh, next. So there's no, there's no, there there was no change point there, obviously. So for uh, incidence and latency, the key study findings, we confirmed elevated incidence of prostate cancer, stem melanoma, and thyroid cancer, along with the reduced incidence of lung cancer. Uh, these were consistent with what we've seen before. We found a previously unreported elevated incidence of tonsil cancer. We did not confirm previously reported elevated incidence of some hemologic cancers. We found some previously unreported reduced incidence of some GI and gynecological cancers. And we find shorter than expected latency induction periods for prostate cancer and skin melanoma. And we did not find a latency period at all for thyroid cancer. Now, if you look at um, the, some of the papers from uh, Chernobyl, uh, there was a very short latency period there. So that is not completely inconsistent there, but uh, look at some of the work from Rachel's group on her ancillary study, and you'll see some more interesting things about thyroid cancer in this population. Next. Some of the limitations in the incidence analyses, these are obviously self-report exposure, um, but we're pretty confident. Uh, most people in New York know when they first got to the, to the, to the World Trade Center site. Uh, everybody knows where they were that day. There's always the potential for unmeasured confounding, but we did do a good job at, report, at controlling for self-reported demographics. Uh, this is a general population comparison, not similar in occupation, which is important to have the occupational study cohort studies, including the career firefighter health study, which published a recent paper of, about this. Uh, there was self-selection in some of the cohorts. However, for all of these analyses I didn't mention, the analyses were restricted to persons who enrolled prior to the passage of the Drug Act which would have caused, uh, which would uh, then later on cover cancer. So um, while this, uh, so we don't think that that is going to be a major bias here. We don't know about levels of screening, except what was done in the program post Cedroga Act. Uh, and in the case of uh, the FDNY cohort, uh, there was some prostate cancer screening and some lung cancer screening done earlier, and we'll, we'll, I'll talk a tiny bit about that later on. Another issue, cancer treatment can cause cancer for reasons that are not entirely known. Uh, persons who have uh, one primary cancer are at higher risk for having a second unrelated cancer. Uh, and that's why if you noticed in the uh, findings for the primary instance analyses, we had two analyses there. One that was restricted to first primary cancers and another that was all cancers, including second and even third primary cancers. Uh, and as you saw, there was not a lot of difference in the relative hazards, but we haven't really looked at second primaries and how uh, they are associated specifically themselves with the World Trade Center exposure or they might be associated with treatment. And we actually have a pending grant application in to uh, look in part to look at that. Imperfect case ascertainment. I glossed over how did we pick the cancer registries? Largely it was based on Census Bureau out migration statistics as to where people moved outside of the New York area uh, a decade ago. Uh, we think that we cover 90% of the population. So we are not able to say that we caught all cancers. That is an issue with pretty much any major linkage study in a country with 51 separate cancer registry, registries. Uh, and of course, um, because we used probabilistic record linkage in order to do the linkage, we're not going to be absolutely perfect, but I think we did a really good job with the exception of the cancers that are in states that we did not link to, such as Illinois, for instance. New York State references reference rates are higher for some cancers other than other potential comparison populations, such as New York City or SEER. 
uh, or one of the, any of the several series. And that's actually something that we said we would do in the grant application. I hope we will uh, complete those analyses next year. Our moto time bias. This is an issue. Some in, if someone enrolls into one of the cohorts in 2004, they have to have survived long enough to uh, be able to enroll in the cohort. So if you have someone who gets a World Trade Center related cancer in 2003 and dies in early 2004, but before they have a chance to enroll in one of the cohorts, that case will not be captured. We believe that this is a small matter because uh, most of the cancers we're talking about here are going to have a latency period longer than the period by which most of the people would have enrolled into the study. Uh, but it is a potential concern. And as we do more work on latency, we'll be able to rule that out more. Uh, and of course, for the rare cancers, we had limited power. Next. So further research, obviously, compares to other reference populations, occupational cohorts, additional follow-up. We're gonna be looking at more uh, sites for latency uh, and we'll be able to confirm or not uh, some of these findings that we have for it. I mentioned secondary primary, second primary cancers already, next. So our third aim is to look at cancer survival, next. Uh, and what we looked at was survival uh, from cancer diagnosis for all cancers, all cause mortality, uh, cancer specific mortality uh, in members of the cohort who are in medical monitoring programs sponsored by NASH and those who are not. And uh, we were surprised at what we found, or at least some of us, I was, uh, I don't think maybe everybody was, but what we found was a dramatically uh, reduced mortality, a dramatic survival benefit in individuals who were part of a NIOSH sponsored World Trade Center Health Program medical monitoring and treatment program. And there you see the hazard ratios. It was not only there for cancer specific mortality, but it was slightly greater for uh, all cause mortality. This was not seen in the members of the cohort who were not in a World Trade Center Health Pro Medical Monitor and Treatment Program. Now, one of the concerns is that if you are starting follow-up on a cancer survival study at date of diagnosis, you have the potential for lead time and length bias. And one of the ways to address lead time bias is not to start at date of diagnosis with your analysis, but to start at a fixed time regardless of dating di date of diagnosis. And we found very similar results when we did that, and that is the second panel there. Um, and we, look, we tried to partially address potential length time bias by controlling for cancer stage. Next slide with even more fascinating findings. Oh, yeah. So uh, I've always believed that cancer is not one disease, but many. And so we want, and of course, different cancers have very different prognoses. So we looked at uh, the most common cancer sites that we had in the cohort in terms of uh, uh, numbers and uh, mortality. And uh, we did not include thyroid here because thyroid cancer has such a uh, high survival rate, but you see a number of them there. And what we found for prostate, colorectal, lung and bronchial, and kidney and renal pelvis cancers, dramatically increased survival, dramatically reduced all-cause mortality. And that was limited to the individuals who were in a medical monitoring and treatment program. We also saw not significant, but magnitude, uh, uh, the magnitude of reduced mortality uh, for skin melanoma, multiple myeloma, esophageal, and liver cancer. We did not see any benefit to uh, our members who were diagnosed with either pancreatic cancer or brain and nervous system cancer. Uh, and we know that those have a poor prognosis. So um, I'd like to point out that we found dramatically lower incidence rates 
for colorectal and lung cancer. Uh, so this is definitely not a lead time bias issue from we're just getting cancers earlier for those cancers. Uh, and we did not find a significantly different from the general population for kidney cancer. Uh, so what we are seeing here, I think, is a real survival benefit. This is quite a larger survival benefit than most cancer screening studies have seen. Most cancer screening studies see benefits of anywhere from 10% to 30% for cancer-specific mortality, and very few have reported mortality benefit for all-cause mortality. Uh, the National Lung Screening Study was an exception uh, for lung CT screening, and uh, one of the Scandinavian mammography studies did. Uh, but here we have something that is well beyond what uh, we would expect to see if it were just screening that were being done through the Zadrog Act. Next, next slide. Um, so as I said, uh, we think we have ruled out many of the potential causes of bias that would normally uh, be, cause problems. Uh, I mentioned we included cancer stage in the models and we had similar effects, we had similar uh, uh, benefits. Um, and I mentioned uh, lead time bias. Uh, the scientific question that I think is important is how is the World Trade Center Health Program accomplishing this? Next slide. Um, Actually, I think I just said this, so I will go on. Next slide. So this should uh, be the impetus for, for further research. Uh, we should compare this to similar occupational cohorts, such as the NIOSH firefighter study, to see if the World Trade Center program actually provides a similar benefit to people with similar occupations. It is possible, although I would not have an explanation, that firefighters, police officers, construction workers, communication workers all have some reason why they are more likely to uh, do better in, in getting their cancer, uh, aggressive treatment for their cancer. Uh, what are the aspects of the program that can create this benefit? Is there a benefit for persons without cancer? And there is a study in progress right now, analyses are being done to look at mortality in the World Trade Center Health Program uh, in a cohort that is basically the same as this one. Can these survival benefits be generalized to other occupational cohorts or to the general population? And I would add even potentially to other conditions in occupational cohorts. Do other cancer support programs provide similar visit, benefits? We have a cancer support program at our institution uh, that the hospital, Montefiore Medical Center has. Uh, and as far as I know, we've not done a formal analysis to see what the benefit is, and I'm nagging them to try to do that kind of an analysis. So this is potentially extremely important for people with cancer, people in the program. Uh, next. I think that the survival benefit is a dramatic demonstration of the value of the World Trade Center Health Program to the members of the program. By members, I mean uh, the people who are participating. This justifies further outreach to rescue recovery workers who are not yet in a medical monitoring treatment program. This supports the idea that we should look at the impact on the survivor program and the national program and possible outreach to those populations there. I think there was a comment in the chat. Can we look at the survivors? Absolutely. I, I think that we really need to look at that. The exposure was different. Uh, we, don't, we don't know uh, whether the probably generally lower exposure will have the same effects. Uh, and this supports continued follow-up this combined cohort to look at the induction latency period for cancers that have not been observed to have elevated incidence. Uh, and um, to answer further questions there. Next. I wanna thank 
this large number of individuals who've been participating in this. And I apologize to anybody whom I have not included. I mainly looked at the uh, names on the publications to get this. Um, as you can see, it's not quite thousands, but it's a large group. We had many meetings where we argued and came to consensus on difficult questions. It has been an honor to have been one of the leaders of this effort. Uh, and I am really uh, very happy that the result, particularly for the survival, showed that this is not only scientifically important, but having an, a positive impact on these heroes who ran towards the site early on and in the days following and in the weeks and months following. They are heroes and they deserve everything that we can give them. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are the publications that we've had from the program. Uh, many of them were uh, made open access uh, thanks to the uh, available funding that was given that was given by NIOSH. So I encourage everybody to look at them. You will probably have questions. You will probably discover weaknesses that are not mentioned. Uh, I may have actually thought of some of them already. Uh, and uh, you may even have discovered some that you want to ask questions about now. Uh, but I'm uh, really happy to uh, go on and take questions. Uh, this concludes the formal part of the presentation, and I'm around to answer questions. Thank you again for allowing me to be the lead uh, for this series. Uh, it has been an honor and a privilege to do this work and to work with such a great bunch of collaborators. Thank you. Rachel, thank you so much. This was amazing information to share with all of us, and we appreciate your time and, and all the work that you've done. Um, this is just mind-blowing. It's fantastic, so thank you. Thank you so much for you and Travis for inviting me, and uh, I look forward to more in this series.